Hi, I'm Sharon, Education and Youth Librarian with Wyndham City Libraries. Welcome back to Virtual Teen Read Along for Chapter 15 of Tomorrow When the War Began by John Marsden. Ali, Homer and Fiona have collected more supplies from Ali's house, including food, toiletries and a Bible for Corrie. Ali has been exploring and discovered the Hermit's Hut. Let's read Chapter 15. After inspection of the Hermit Hut, we kept working on into the evening. Lee, being less mobile, got to do the paperwork, in particular of a system of food rationing that would preserve our supplies for close to two months. If we had the self-control to stick to it. Homer and Fee and I made a few little veggie gardens. In the long day at last cool, we put in some seeds, lettuce, silverbeet, cauliflower, broccoli, peas and broad beans. We didn't much fancy eating all those for the rest of our lives, but we need our greens, as Fee said firmly. With Lee's cooking skills, broccoli could be turned into chocolate chip ice cream and cauliflower into a fairy coach. It had been a long day, a hot one and a hard and tiring one. We'd started so early. My talk with Lee hadn't made it easier either. There was a bit of strain between us now, which I hated. There was a general strain caused by everyone snapping at each other in the final few hours of daylight. The only exception was Homer, who hadn't snapped at Fee. He'd had a go at me, about the amount of water I was putting on the vegetable seeds, and at Lee, over whether soccer was a better sport than footy, but Fee was immune. He wasn't immune from her, though, and he broke off a big piece of fruitcake, Mrs. Gruber's, and ate it. She burned his ears with a string of words like greedy and selfish and pig. Homer was so used to being told off in his life that he might as well have told a rock off for being sedimentary. But when Fee went for him, he stood there like a little kid, red in the face and wordless. He ate the rest of his slice of cake, but I don't think he enjoyed it. I was so glad she hadn't seen me with the ice vivo biscuits. Yes, finding the hut had been the only highlight of the afternoon. Fee had moved into my tent while Corrie was away, and that night as we lay in bed, she said to me, Ali, what am I going to do about Homer? You mean the way he likes you? Yes. Mm, it's a problem. I wish I knew what to do. This was my specialty, sorting out my friends' love lives. When I left school, I was going to take it up as a career. I opened a business where people could come in off the street and tell me all their boyfriend and girlfriend problems. It was just a shame I couldn't figure out my own. So I rolled over to where I could see Fee's small face in the darkness. Her big eyes were wide open with worry. Do you like him? We had to start somewhere. Yes, of course. But I mean, I know what you mean. Yes, I think I do. Yes, I do. I didn't at school, but honestly, he was such a moron there. If anyone had said to me that I'd end up liking him, well, I'd have paid their taxi fare to the psychiatrist. He was so immature. Yes, remember that water fight at the Halloween social? Oh, don't remind me. So if you like him now, what's stopping you? I don't know. That's the hard part. I don't know if I like him as much as he likes me. That's one thing. I'd hate to get into a relationship with him where he assumed I felt as strongly as he does. I don't think I could ever like him that much. He's so... She couldn't think of a word to end the sentence, so I supplied one. Greek? Yes. I mean, I know he was born out here, but he's still Greek when it comes to girls. Do you mind that he's Greek or part Greek or whatever you call it? No, I love it. Greek is sexy. Sexy sounded funny coming from Fee. She was so well brought up, she didn't normally use words like that. So is that the only thing stopping you, that you don't feel as strongly as he does? Sort of. I feel like I have to keep him at arm's length, he'll just take over. It's like you build a dam upstream to stop the village being washed away. I'm the village, and I build a dam by being cool and casual with him. That might just make him more passionate. Oh, do you think so? I never thought of it like that. Oh, it's so complicated. She yawned. What would you do if you were in my position? That was a tough question, because I was half in her position anyway. It was my feelings for Homer that was stopping me from taking the plunge with Lee. It would have been just my luck to be cast on a desert island with two guys and to like both of them. But Fee saying sexy had made me realise that with Homer, it was pretty physical. I didn't want to spend hours with him talking about life. I wanted to spend hours with him making animal noises like sighs and grunts and press harder or touch me there again. With Lee, it was something else. I was fascinated by his ideas, the way he thought about things. I thought I would see life differently the more I talked to Lee. It's like I could learn from him. I didn't know much about his life, but when I looked at his face and his eyes, it was like looking into the Atlantic Ocean. I wanted to know where I could, what I could find in there, what interesting secrets he knew. So in answer to Fee's question, I just said, don't string him along forever. Homer likes excitement. He likes to get on with it. He's not the world's most patient guy. She said sleepily, so you think I should try it? Better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. If you go for it and it doesn't work, well, what if you lost? But if he loses interest, so you never have anything with him, 
then you'll spend the rest of your life wondering what might have been. Fee drifted off to sleep, but I lay awake listening to the night sounds, the breeze in the hot trees, the howls of feral dogs in the distance, the occasional throaty call of a bird. Wondered how I'd feel if Fee got off with Homer. I still couldn't quite believe that suddenly I liked Homer so much. He'd been a neighbour, a brother, for so long. I tried to think back to the way he'd been a month ago, a year ago, five years ago, when he was just a kid. I wanted to work out when he'd become attractive, or why I hadn't noticed it before. But I couldn't feel anything much for the way he'd been in those days. It's like he metamorphosed. Overnight he'd become sexy and interesting. A dog howled again, and I started wondering about the hermit. Maybe that howl was the hermit coming back to his violated house, coming to look for the people who trespassed into his secret sanctuary. I wriggled closer to Fee, feeling quite spooked. It had been strange, finding that little hut, so skillfully concealed. Must have really hated people to go to so much trouble. I'd half expected the place to feel full of evil, satanic powers, as though he'd huddled there for years holding black masses. What sort of man could do what he'd done? How could he have gone on with his life? But the hut hadn't felt all that evil. There'd been an atmosphere there, but one that was hard to define. It was a sad, brooding place, but not evil. As sleep crept up on me, I turned my mind to my evening ritual that I perform now, no matter how tired I was. Sort of a movie that I ran in my head every night. In the movie, I watched my parents going about their normal lives. I made sure to see their faces as often as possible, and I pictured them in all kinds of everyday situations. Dad dropping bales of hay off to the sheep, waiting at the wheel when I opened a gate, sweating as he tightened the belts on the tractor and his moleskins at the field days. Mum in the kitchen. She was a real kitchen person. Mum, feminism had made her more outspoken, but maybe hadn't changed her activities much. Pictured her looking for her library books, digging up spuds, talking on the phone, swearing as she lit the fuel stove, swearing that she'd change it for an electric one tomorrow. She never did. She claimed she was keeping the agar because when we started taking tours for farm stays, they'd think it was a picturesque. That made me smile. I didn't know if I was making myself feel bad by trying to make myself feel good, thinking about my parents. But it was my way of keeping them alive and in my thoughts. I was scared of what might happen if I stopped doing that. I let them start drifting away, the way I was drifting away now, into sleep. Normally I'd be thinking about Lee too, at about this time, hugging him to me and imagining his smooth brown skin and firm lips. But tonight I was too tired. And I'd already th- thought about him enough today. I fell asleep and dreamt about him instead. The couple of days with Homer and Fee and Lee had promised to be interesting, and that's the way they were turning out. In fact, they were almost too interesting. It's getting to be a strain on my emotions. We were all edgy anyway, wondering how the other four were getting on. But Tuesday started cooler and proved to be cooler in most ways. It was an intriguing day, a day I won't forget. We'd agreed to get up early again. I'd noticed that the longer we stayed in hell, the more we fell into a natural rhythm, going to bed when it was dark and getting up at dawn. That wasn't the routine we'd had at home, no way. But here we gradually started doing it without noticing. It wasn't quite that simple. We often stayed up after dark to light a fire, to do some cooking for the next day, or even just to have a cup of tea. Quite a few of us missed our cups of tea during the day. But before long, people would be yawning and standing and stretching and throwing out the dregs in the mug, then wandering away to their tents. So when it was still cold and damp on that Tuesday morning, we gathered at the dead fire, talking occasionally and listening to the soft voices of the magpies and the startled muttering of the chooks. We had our usual cold breakfast. Most nights now I soaked dried fruit in water in a tightly covered belly so the possums couldn't get at it. By morning, the fruit was juicy and tasty and we had it with muesli or other cereal. They usually had powdered milk which was also reconstituted the night before. To have it ready for the morning, we'd scrounged a few more tubes of condensed milk on our trip to the Grubers, but again, that hadn't lasted long. All we diabetics in training sucked them dry within 24 hours. Our major job that morning was to get firewood. We wanted to build up a big pile, then camouflage it. It sounds crazy with all the bush around us, but firewood was quite hard to get because the bush was so dense. There were lots of little jobs needed doing too. Chopping wood, digging drainage trenches around the tents. Digging a new dunny, we'd filled our first one, making up tightly sealed packs of food that we could store around the mountains, as Homer had suggested. Because Lee was not very mobile, he got the last job, as well as the dishwashing and cleaning the rifles. The plan was to work hard most of the morning, have a break after lunch, then go out that night to bring more loads in from the landy. We did get a lot done before the day warmed up enough to slow us down. We got a stack of firewood that was about a metre high and three metres wide, plus a separate pile of kindling. We dug our trenches and dunny and put up a better shelter for the chooks. It was amazing how much work four people could get through compared to what with Dad and I could achieve. But it did worry me that we were still so heavily dependent on supplies brought up 
from the four-wheel drives. That was a short-term solution. Even with our own vegetables, even with the hens, we were a long way of being self-sufficient. Suppose we were here for three months, or six, or two years. It was unthinkable, but it was very possible. <laughs> I have a lunch with the other two were very busy for a minute, Lee said to me in a low voice. Would you be able to show me the hermit's hut this afternoon? I was startled. But yesterday when the other two came, you said, you said your leg? Yes, I know. But I've used it quite a bit today. It feels quite good. Anyway, I was in a bad mood with you yesterday. I grinned. Okay, I'll take you. I'll do a robin and carry you back if you need it. There must have been something in the air because when I told the other two that if Lee's leg was good enough, we'd be away for an hour or two, Homer gave Fee a swift wink. I think Fee must have given you Homer some encouragement during the morning. Because it wasn't the, ooh, Lee and Allie type wink. It was a, good, we'll get some time together wink. It was very sneaky of them. I'm sure if we hadn't given them the opportunity, they would have come up with some lie to get away on their own. It made me feel jealous, though. I wish I could cancel our paddle so I could stay back and chaperone. Deep down in my heart, I really didn't want Homer and Fee to be together. There was nothing I could do, though. I'd been neatly trapped. So at around two o'clock, I set off towards the creek with Lee limping beside me. The journey was surprisingly quick this time because I knew how to do it now and went there more deliberately and confidently because Lee was moving more freely than I'd expected. The water gurgled along, refreshing, cold, and just went with the flow. It's a perfect path in, Lee commented, because we don't leave any tracks. Mm. You know, on the other side of Hell is the Holloway River and Risden. There must be a way through from there. It'd be interesting to try and find it by following this creek, maybe. We got to the hut, but Lee's first priority was to talk. He sat down on a rather damp log by the edge of the creek. I'll just give my leg a rest, he said. Is it hurting? A little. Only an ache from being used again. I think exercise is probably the best thing for it. He paused. You know, Ali, I didn't ever thank you properly for coming to get me that night from the restaurant. You guys were heroes. You really put it on the line for me. I'm not too good at being big emotional speeches, but I won't forget that for the rest of my life. That's okay, I said uncomfortably. You did thank me once already, and you'd have done the same for us. And I'm sorry about yesterday. What's to be sorry about? You said you wanted to say. You said what you thought, which is more than I did. Well, say it now. I grinned. Maybe I should. Though I wasn't planning to say any more. I thought for a minute and decided to take the plunge. I was nervous, but it was exciting. All right, I'll say what I think. But just remember, it's not necessarily what I really think, because I don't know what I think. He groaned. Oh, Ali, you're so frustrating. You haven't even started and already you're getting me churned up. This is the same as yesterday. Well, you want me to be honest or don't you? All right, go on, and I'll try to keep control of my blood pressure. Okay, having said that, I wasn't even sure of where to start. Lee, I do like you very much. I think you're interesting, funny, smart. You've got my favourite eyes in Where Are We. It's just not that sure I like you in that way. You know what I mean? That day in the hay shed, my feelings got the better of me. But there's something about you. I don't know what it is, but you make me nervous a little never met anyone quite like you. And one thing I wonder is, suppose we started going round together and it didn't work out. Here we are, there's seven of us, no eight now, living in this out of the way place in these really strange times. The whole world turned upside down, yet we get on pretty well together most of the time. I'd hate to spoil that by the two of us suddenly having a falling out and I deciding we didn't want to see each other. We were embarrassed to be together. That'd be awful be like Adam and Eve having a fight in the Garden of Eden. I mean, who would they talk to then? The apple tree? The snake? Oh, Ali, Lee said. Why do you have to reason everything through all the time? The future is a future. It has to take care of itself. You can sit here all day and make guesses about it. And at the end of the day, what have you got? A lot of dead guesses, that's what. And in the meantime, you haven't done anything. You haven't lived because you're so busy reasoning it all out. That's not true, I said, getting annoyed. Where we got the truck and rescued you, that was all done with reason. If we hadn't figured out all the possibilities first, it would never have worked. But a lot of it you were just making up as you went along, he said. I remember how you told me you changed a plan about something. The route you took, I think it was. And there were lots of things, like slamming the brakes on to catch the car behind. That was going with your gut feelings. So you think I should live life from the gut, not from the head? He laughed. Not when you put it like that. I guess it's a place for both. I'll tell you what it's like. It's like my music. Lee was brilliant, grade six piano already, the best for his ageing, where are we? When I'm learning a piece, when I'm playing, I've got to have my heart and my mind involved. My mind is thinking about technique, my heart is feeling the passion of the music. So I suppose it's the same as life, you've got to have both. 
and you think I'm all head and no heart? No. Stop twisting what I'm saying. But remember the guy who lived here. His heart must have gradually dried up till it was like a little dried apricot and all he had left was his reason. I hope it was a big consolation to him. So do you think I'm all head and no heart? You think I'll end up in this little hut, the hermitus from hell? No friends, no one to love me. Excuse me, I'm going down the garden to eat worms. No, I just think for some things, for example, like someone, for example, like in me, you're being too careful and calculating. You should just go with the feelings. But my feelings are that I'm confused, I said miserably. That's probably because your feelings are being confused by your mind. Your feelings might be coming through your through loud and clear, but before they get to the surface, your brain gets in the way and muddles them around. So I'm sort of a TV that's been put too close to a computer. I'm getting interference with my picture. I wasn't sure if I believed all this or it was just Lee spitting a line. Guys will say anything. Yes, Lee said. The question is, what program's showing on the TV? A debate on the meaning of life or a passionate love story? I know what you'd like to be, I said. Porno starring us. He grinned. How can I say I love you for your mind after everything I've just said? But I do. It was the first time he'd used the word love and it sobered me a bit. This relationship could get easily get serious. The trouble was I was avoiding mentioning Homer and one reason Lee couldn't understand me was because he didn't understand about Homer, although he'd had a guess the day before. I think it had been less confused if I'd been more honest with him. But I knew about Homer and I was still confused. I sighed and I got up. Come on, cripple, let's go and look at the hut. This was my third trip to the hut, so it was losing interest for me a little. But Lee poked around for quite a while. There was more light in there this time. It probably all depended on the time of day. But there was some filtered sunlight that relieved the darkness along the back wall. Lee went to the hut's only window, a glassless square in the back wall. He put his head through it and had a look at it, the mint outside, then investigated the rotting window frame. Beautifully made, he said. Look at these joints. Wait, there's some metal here. How do you mean? I came up beside him as he started wrestling with the window sill. I could see then what he meant. The sill was rotting through, and between the decayed splinters, a dull black metal surface was visible. Suddenly, Lee lifted the sill straight off. It was clearly made to come away. For underneath was a geometrically neat cavity, not much bigger than a shoebox, and fitting neatly into it was a grey metal cash box, about a shoebox size. Wow! I was astonished and excited. Unreal! It's probably full of gold! Lee, eyes staring, lifted it out. It's pretty light, he said. Too light for gold. The box was showing the early signs of rust, with some red lines starting to creep along it, but it was in good condition. It was unlocked and opened easily. Craning over Lee's arm, I saw nothing but papers and photographs. It was disappointing, though I realised later gold wasn't much use to us, living our gorilla life up in the mountains. Lee lifted out the papers and the photos. Underneath them was a small blue case, like a wallet, but made of stiffer material and fastened with a small gold clasp. He opened that carefully. Inside, wrapped in tissue paper and resting on white linen cloth, was a brightly coloured short white ribbon attached to a heavy bronzed medal. Fantastic, I breathed. He was a war hero. Lee took it out. On the front was a relief of a king. I'm not sure which one. And the words, he who would be valiant. Lee turned it over. On the back was engraved, Bertram Christie for gallantry, Battle of Marana, and a date which is too blurred to read. The room was coloured red, yellow and blue. We handled it, felt it, wandered over it, mapped it back up carefully and replaced it in its box before turning our attention to the papers. There were a few of these, a notebook, a letter or two, some newspaper clippings and a couple of official looking documents. There were three photographs, one of a stern looking young couple on their wedding day, one of the woman alone, standing in front of a bare wooden house, and one of the woman with a toddler. The woman was young but looked sad. She had long dark hair and a slim, smooth face. She might have been Spanish. I looked at the photos intently. These must be the ones he murdered, I whispered. Funny that he kept their photos if he murdered them, Lee said. I looked at the face of the man in the wedding photo. He looked younger. Younger than the woman, maybe. He gazed steadily at the camera. Clear, strong eyes and a firm, clean-shaven chin. I could see nothing of the murder in his face. Nothing of the victim in his wife's or child's. Lee started opening the documents. The first seemed to be a newspaper account of a sermon. I only read the first paragraph. The sermon was based on a verse from the Bible. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snar to himself. It looked long and boring, so I didn't read any more. The other newspaper clippings was a short article that was headlined, Victims of Mount Tumbler Tragedy, Laid to Rest. It read, 
A small group of mourners were in attendance at the Mount Tumbler Church of England on Monday last, where Reverend Horace Green conducted a service for the burial of the dead. Laid to rest were Imogen Mary Christie of Mount Tumbler and her infant child, Alfred Bertram Christie, aged three. The Christie family were not well known, being newly arrived, living a good distance from town and being apparently of reclusive disposition. But the tragedies aroused considerable sentiment in the district, which was touched on most feelingly by Reverend Green in his address, which had for its text, Man that is born of woman hath but a short time to live, and is full of misery. He cometh up, and is cut down like a flower. The deceased were then interred in the Mount Tumbler Cemetery. A public meeting will be held in the Mount Tumbler School of Arts on Monday next, under the chairmanship of, Mount, of Mr Donald MacDonald, JP, to canvass again the possibility of obtaining the services of a medical practitioner for the Mount Tumbler district. The Christie tragedy led us to fresh agitation for the provision of medical services for the area. An inquest into the deaths of Mrs Christie and her child will take place at the next visit in the magistrate to the district on April 15. In the meantime, Constable Wykes has cautioned against idle tongues making loose speculation upon the facts of the case, a sentiment most earnestly shared by this correspondent. That was all. I read it over Lee's shoulder. Seems to raise more questions than answers, I said. Doesn't mention the husband at all, Lee said. The next item was a stiff formal card of cream paper, though yellowed now. It seemed to be the citation to the company the medal. In ornate flowing writing, it described the actions of Private Bertram Christie in running forward under enemy fire to rescue a wounded and conscious corporal of another regiment. In conveying his fellow soldiers safely back to his own lines, Private Christie endangered his own life and displayed conspicuous gallantry for which His Majesty is pleased to honour Private Bertram Christie with the Order of the St George Medal. Curious and Curiousia, Lee said. Sounds like you and Robin, I said. I reckon she should get a medal. There are a few odds and ends then, birth certificates for all three Christies, the married certificate of Bertram and Imogen, a postcard addressed to Bertram from his wife and saying merely, we will be on the 415 train, mother sends her kind regards, your devoted wife Imogen. There were some bank documents and a notebook containing lots of accounts and figures, I pointed to one item that said, to a double bed, four pounds, ten shillings, sixpence. How much is that? Lee asked. About eight dollars, I think. Don't you double the number of pounds? I don't know what you do with the shillings and pence. Then we come to the last of the formal documents, a long sheet of paper with a red seal on top. It was typed and signed at the bottom with a black flourish of ink. We settled down to read it and found in the dry language of the coroner the story of the man who had killed his wife and child. Be it known by all persons having business with His Majesty's courts that I, Harold Armory Douglas Batty, being duly appointed magistrate and coroner of the district of Mount Tumbler, make the following findings and recommendations with respect to the deaths of Imogen Mary Christie, aged 24, married, woman of this parish, and Alfred Bertram Christie, aged 3, infant of this parish, both residing at Block 16A on the Aberfoyle Track, 44 miles to the southwest of Pink Mountain. 1. That both deceased met their deaths on or about December 24 last at the hands of Bertram Hubert Sexton Christie as a result of bullet wounds to the head. 2. That both deceased lived with Bertram Hubert Sexton Christie, farmer, in the relationships respectively of wife and son to the said Bertram Hubert Sexton Christie, in a wooden cottage at the above address, this being a particularly remote part of the Mount Tumbler district. 3. That there is no evidence of marital disharmony between Bertram Hubert Sexton Christie and Imogen Mary Christie, and that on the contrary, Bertram Hubert Sexton Christie was a loving husband and father, Imogen Mary Christie a dutiful and an even-tempered wife, and the child, Alfred Bertram Christie, a sweet child of good disposition, and that is a testimony of Wilson Hubert George, farmer and neighbour to the deceased, and Muriel Edna Maybury, married woman and neighbour to the deceased. 4. That the nearest medical practitioner or nursing sister to the Christies was at Dunstan Lake, being a day and a half's ride away and further. 5. That severe bushfires were burning on and around the Aberfoyle Track, the Mount Tumbler, Mount Octopus Road, Wild Goat Track and to the south of Pink Mountain, which had the effect of isolating the Christie property that this information was known to Bertram Hubert Sexton Christie. 6. That both deceased met their deaths either as a result of bushfire consuming the Christie residence, during which both were terribly burnt, and that Bertram Hubert Sexton Christie, believing their injuries to be mortal and unable to bear their suffering, and knowing also that medical aid was beyond immediate reach, killed both deceased with single shots to the head from a rifle owned by Bertram Hubert Sexton Christie. And that is a testimony of Bertram Hubert Hubert Sexton Christie, or 
their both deceased were willfully and felonously murdered by Bertram Hubert Sexton Christie with the aforesaid rifle and the bodies deliberately burned in an attempt to conceal the facts of the case. 7. That medical science cannot say to which came first, the bullets or the burning, and that is a testimony of Dr Jackson Muirfield Watson, medical practitioner and forensic scientist of Stratton and District Hospital, Stratton. 8. That police inquiries have been unable to locate any other persons with evidence bearing upon the deaths of Imogen Mary Christie or Alfred Bertram Christie, and that is a testimony of Constable Frederick John Wykes of the police station, Mount Tumbler. 9. That on the evidence before me, I am unable to make any further findings as to the manner in which the deceased met their deaths. Recommended. 1. That urgent consideration be given to the provision of medical services at Mount Tumbler. 2. That the Director of Public Prosecutions lays an information of willful and felonious murder against Bertram Hubert Sexton Christie. Signed by the hand of me, Harold Armory Douglas Batty, in the Mount Tumbler's Magistrate Court this day, the 18th of April. The group are irritable with each other. Though unlike the last trip to hell, they are planning ahead and planting vegetables. The group is now driven. Ali and Lee find a hidden box in the hut, but they don't tell the others. Would you have told them? Join me again in the next episode for Chapter 16 of Tomorrow When the War Began.